right? So if you will, let's go to Deuteronomy 11, meaning I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a lot of the Bible, okay? Do you all want to stand up for a minute? Like, is anybody else like feeling the evening lull, or are you guys all good? Just get your wiggles out. That's what we tell our kids. Just get your wiggles out. Okay, Gen- or, uh, Deuteronomy 11. Have you guys just loved the last few days? Have you enjoyed this time? Man, you guys are so enthusiastic. Let me tell you. Woo! Deuteronomy 11. I have been parked here for a little bit, but Deuteronomy 11, we're going to start in verse 10. For the land which you are entering to possess is not like the land of Egypt from where you came where you sowed your seed and watered it with your foot like a vegetable garden. But the land which you are entering to possess is a land of hills and valleys and drinks water from the rain of heaven, a land for which the Lord your God cares. The eyes of the Lord your God are always on it from the beginning of the year even to the end of the year. Do you guys understand that here we see that the Israelites have to shift their mindset from being slaves in Egypt to possessing a promise. And right now, we keep talking about this promise is coming, this promise is coming. I'm telling you guys, the promises of God are yes and amen, they're for today. But we have to shift our mindset to going from it's coming tomorrow to God help me live in it right now. Someone recently said to me, they said, Brandy, do you feel like you're living the dream God gave you years ago. And I said, yeah, actually I am. Have you guys ever thought of that? Are the promises that God gave you a decade ago, have you already lived some of them? Are you living them right now? Are you still waiting for them to come one day? Listen, guys, God is so good and he's so gracious. He'll bring everything around and he'll work everything out for our good. But not every promise that you get, you'll always be able to fulfill. Like if when you were 20 years old, you got a prophetic word that you're going to become a Dallas Cowboys cheerleader. And today you're 60, 70, 80. Praise God, you can take your little pom-poms and go cheer at the stadium by yourself all day. But you're probably not going to become a real Dallas Cowboys cheerleader. Pray for Barbie. Why? Because when you got the promise and you got the word, you never stepped into it. And I'm telling you guys, we have to go from this place of what's coming to recognizing it's already here. We have to actually get started in what God's promised us to do. When I graduated college, I'm hungry for God. I'm trying to figure out Either all of the Bible is real or none of it's real. I'm an all or nothing person, right? And I was like, well, it says in there that you should be doing all these miracles and crazy things that Jesus did. And I was like, no one in my Baptist church was doing any of that. None. And I was so afraid of what people thought of me that I thought, well, I can't pray for anyone around me. So what I did was I I thought to myself, okay, how I'm going to figure out if this is real is I'm going to go to, I grew up in Cincinnati, to the inner city of Cincinnati, to the worst area I could find, and I'm going to go where all the drug addicts and the prostitutes and the homeless people are, and I went and I bought them $1 tacos from Taco Bell, because my thinking was, man, a lot of these people are crazy, and so I don't care if they think I'm crazy. Seriously, that was my thought process at the time, and I would go day after day with my $1 tacos from Taco Bell, because I knew it would at least get them to stop and talk to me, And I would give them the taco, and then I would say, how can I pray for you? I mean, I would go day after day and weeks. And one day, I go to church on Sunday morning. We all go to this Chinese buffet. How many guys go to the Chinese buffet ever? Come on, pre-COVID anyway. And, uh, And I have this voicemail. This was when it was old brick phones, you know, even before the flip phone time. And 
this lady, Martha, is on the other line, and she said, Brandy, what time are you going to be here with the tacos? You know, she would always, I mean, they would call me all the time. When are you going to be there with tacos? You got to understand, Martha lived in a halfway house. Martha was a prostitute half the time, addicted to a handful of things. When we found Martha out with this group I was part of, literally Martha only had a shirt on, only a shirt on the backside of a dumpster, okay? And so at the end of her voicemail, she goes, by the way, when I got up today, all my teeth were back. And I was like, I'm sorry. I made every person at my table listen to the voicemail. I said, can you listen to this and tell me what she said at the end? And they're like, she said something about her teeth and her teeth are back. And I was like, so I, you know, I'm like, whoa, this is real. I had heard about it, but the reality is I didn't see anything until I actually started stepping into it. I just feel like today, you know, we've had so many awesome messages about understanding who you are and, and, you know, praise God for Joan. I mean, she just got everybody delivered. Just, I love it. Just mass deliverance and freedom in a, in a minute, right? But it's like we have to understand who we are and what we're really called to. Come on, guys. It's not coming. It's here. We just have to be willing to go for it. So Luke 10, and everyone that's been saved for a year plus probably has heard this story. I want to talk really quick about the Good Samaritan from maybe a little different angle. But Luke 10, starting in verse 30, Jesus replies to this man of the law who's asking a bunch of questions and trying to, you know, in, in many ways trap him. He Jesus replies and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. I'm just going to stop the story there. So Jerusalem to Jericho is roughly 17 miles. And historically, it was known as the way of the blood or the bloody pass because it's this big 17-mile windy road that was easy for robbers, thieves, stuff like that to hang out on, all right? And so it's easy for us all to look at the priests and the Levite and be like, man, look at all these people. They know the right lingo. They know how to have a religious, um, how to res- observe religious practices, but really they're devoid of the true nature and character of God, right? And that's usually what we talk about when we talk about this story, but I want to actually take it a step further, and I want to talk about the fact that you have a road that's 17 miles long that's known as the bloody way or the way of blood. Come on, guys, if priests and Levites should be going multiple times a year from Jerusalem and Jericho and back and forth, why was the road never transformed? Listen, why is your neighborhood and your workplace and your city not transformed? Because we've become common and familiar with whatever junk is going on around us. We've stopped recognizing that, wait a minute, the answer is in me. It's Jesus, the hope of glory. Guys, we are all living in places that we heavily travel but never transform. The good Samaritan was able to transform a life, and that's important. That matters. We're all called to transform the lives of the people around us. But at the same time, God is saying, I'm not only looking for you to transform one life in front of you. I'm looking for you to transform your city. 